could ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. When did I start to forget all of the great things you did? When did I throw away faith for the impossible? How did I start to believe you weren't sufficient for me? Why do I talk myself out of seeing?
lift your name up this morning, God. We give you praise, we give you glory. The beautiful name of Jesus. All of our attention is on you. You're our King, you're our Lord. I pray that you'd help our hearts not forget the things that you've done. Help hearts look forward to the things that you will do. We're here for you. We're here for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. If this is your first time here, glad to see you. You guys can all sit down. Church, everyone. My name is Fanu. I get to serve as one of the lead pastors here at Village. Uh, welcome to all of you in the room and across all of our locations. Surrey North, Langley South, Vancouver, uh, Calgary, Winnipeg, Toronto, and online. Thank you so much for joining us today. And if you are new with us, a special welcome to you. Uh, it's a great Sunday uh, to join us at, at Village for a service because we are launching a brand new series, our summer sermon series on the book of Revelation. Uh, you know, the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible, uh, but for many people, uh, it's probably the first book they'll identify as one of the books that intimidates them uh, because of the vivid, beautiful, and for many of us, mysterious imagery uh, that's throughout the book of Revelation. Uh, things like a, a lion uh, with, uh, with, with six wings and eyes all around, or a locust with the face of a man, and, uh, or, or a lamb with seven th uh, horns and seven eyes, and all of this um, imagery that's throughout the book of Revelation. Uh, and, and we're excited as a church to be able to dive in for the next few weeks and unpack the Revelation, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And to do that, uh, we've got a special guest speaker with us, Daryl Johnson, Pastor Daryl Johnson. Uh, Daryl has over 50 years of ministry experience pastoring in places like California and the Philippines and First Baptist Church in Vancouver. He's actually serving at a church in Vancouver now called The Way. He's also taught at Fuller Theological Seminary and is a teaching fellow at Regent College. You know, when we were thinking as a teaching team, uh, who would we want to come and kick off week one of the series. We couldn't think of a better person to do this than Pastor Daryl. He's actually written a legendary book, I'd say, uh, on the book of Revelation, uh, and it's, it's, it's powerful. It's, it's called Discipleship on the Edge. And so uh, we're so thrilled to have you with us, Daryl. Uh, Daryl is married to his wife, Sharon, who's in the room today uh, for 53 years. Uh, they have four children, 11 grandchildren. Uh, Village Church, can we help welcome, can you help me welcome Pastor Daryl Johnson? to our church to teach today. Daryl, thank you. Thank you for taking the time uh, to be here with us and we're expectant and excited for what God will speak through you today. I'm going to pray and then Shiloh's going to read through Revelation chapter 1 and uh, then we'll hand it over to Daryl. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I uh, thank you for the opportunity that we have to learn from your word today. Would you open our hearts to understand your word? Would you open our eyes to see Jesus in the text? And would you open our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to our church. In Jesus' name, amen. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that soon must take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear, and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. 
I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus are on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning, I saw seven gold lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs on his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet like burnished bronze refined in his furnace. And his voice was like the rush of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Right there for the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, the seven golden lampstands are the seven stars, are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Thank you, Shiloh. It is a great privilege and joy for me to be here at the Village Church. I want to thank Jeremy and Finu and the teaching team for inviting me to launch this new series. And I pray for the team that they will be given all the insight and wisdom they need to be able to understand this very exciting but complex book. And then I pray the, that they be given the courage and the great joy to announce the gospel of this text. It's a gospel that we desperately need to hear in our time. As you, the Village Church, make your way through the last book of the Bible, I think you're going to come to agree with what New Testament scholar Richard Balcom of the UK says of the book. He wrote, The Apocalypse of John is a work of immense learning. It is a work of astoundingly meticulous literary artistry. It is a work of remarkable creative imagination. It is a work of radical political critique. And it is a work of profound theology. The content of the book that for which the book is most famous, is developed in the context of a letter. Many people don't recognize this, but the last book of the Bible is, first of all, a letter. It's a pastoral letter. It's the longest pastoral letter we have in the Bible. The revelation of Jesus Christ, as the Apostle John, who wrote the book, calls the content of the book, comes to us in a pastoral letter. Revelation 1, verses 4 to 5. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. This sounds very much like the way Paul and Peter began their correspondence with the churches that they served and loved. The last book of the Bible is a letter, which means that it is written to people John knows and loves. It's written as a pastor to particular congregations in particular geographical locations and written like the other pastoral epistles of the New Testament, like First and Second Timothy and Titus, to help believers in Jesus actually live as fully devoted followers of Jesus. Those to whom John is writing were under pressure, like that's putting it mildly. They were under pressure to compromise. Under pressure to compromise 
their allegiance to Jesus as Lord. Know anyone like that? (laughs) Some of the people understood the nature of this pressure, and they were resisting it, and not a few were being persecuted. Others were not aware of this pressure because they were simply going with the flow of a culture out of sync with the kingdom of God, and they were therefore losing spiritual vitality. John is writing to both kinds of people to encourage those who are resisting compromise arrangements and to wake up those who are going with the flow. And all the imagery and symbolism is intended to sharpen the issue. The year was either 67 AD or 96 AD. It's either during the reign of Caesar Nero or during the reign of the Emperor Domitian. Either date works for understanding this book because the cultural and political dynamics were the same. I think John wrote the book in 96 AD during the reign of Domitian. Domitian was a powerful leader, a ruthless leader, and like most powerful, ruthless leaders, a profoundly insecure leader who to compensate for his insecurity demanded that people, that, that people are absolutely loyal to him. He ordered all Roman citizens to worship him as Domini et Deus, as Lord and God. He called himself, as the Roman leaders before him called themselves, Son of God and Soter, Savior. Citizens were to regularly go to one of the temples that had been set aside for the worship of Caesar, take a pinch of incense, throw it on an altar, the flame on the altar, and say, Kaiser Kyrios, Caesar is Lord. The Apostle John, now in his senior years, I don't know exactly what his years were, mine are 76, so I know about senior years, could not obey such an edict. Call Caesar emperor? call him king, call him even the great leader. Okay, but call Caesar Lord Kyrie? No way. In the Greek and Roman worlds, the word Kyrios or Lord meant absolute sovereign, sovereign over sovereigns. In the Jewish world, the word Kyrios, Lord, was a substitute for the sacred name of God, for the name Yahweh. When the Roman Senate would meet and Domitian entered the hall, everyone was to rise and say, Hail Kyrios, worthy are you to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Whoa! Just a minute. For John, only one person is worthy of that degree of acclamation. Jesus, only Jesus, only Jesus is Kyrios, Lord. So John, along with the other disciples who confessed Jesus as sovereign and God, were therefore considered threats to the empire. Confessing Caesar as Lord was the glue that held the empire together. Confessing Jesus as Lord was messing with the glue. So those confessing Jesus as Lord had to be dealt with. As far as the empire was concerned, such disciples were atheists. So John was hauled off to the prison island of Patmos, just off the coast of the landmass we now call Turkey. He's left to bleach and rock on the rocks of the island, as Thomas Torrance of Scotland once put it. It had to be a deeply personal crisis for John. And it had to be a hugely challenging crisis for the churches left back on the mainland, the churches John serves as sort of a bishop. Cannot Jesus the Kyrios protect his disciples who refuse to compromise? Cannot Jesus prevent Caesar from persecuting his disciples? It is to that crisis that the last book of the Bible is written. And it does so by putting the crisis into perspective. The revelation gives to John on Patmos puts the crisis into perspective as no other book I know. The revelation helps us see in our time 
understanding what we are going through and why the world is going through what it is going through. And it helps us understand where it is all going as no other book I know. And it gives us this perspective by giving us a comprehensive picture of Jesus, more comprehensive than any other book I know. It's a vision of Jesus that goes beyond the intellect, through the emotions, into our imagination, from where we live our lives, shaping our imagination so that we see Jesus in a way that transforms our emotions and our intellect. When we read this book, the way it was intended to be read, we encounter Jesus in a way that overcomes our fears and that ignites passion and loyalty and courage not to compromise. In the rest of this message, as per the request of the teaching team, I'm going to suggest some principles that will help us navigate our way through the book. Five principles for reading and interpreting the content of the book the way John meant us to read the book. Each of these five principles will begin with the phrase, keep before us. Now, I'll tell you ahead of time, each of these principles is worthy of a separate message. That's just a warning. Here we go. Principle one, keep before us the title of the book. The title is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Just saying the title stirs my soul. The revelation of Jesus Christ, not revelations, not even revelation, and certainly not the revelation of John, but the revelation of Jesus Christ, telling us that this book is fundamentally about a person. Of Jesus Christ, in what sense? How are we to take this little word of? Of in the sense of by Jesus Christ, or of in the sense of about Jesus Christ. Yes, both. <laughs> the title of the book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ. Be clear about the title and we will not go astray as we read the rest of the book. Now, you might know literally the title is The Apocalypse of Jesus Christ. The first words in the Greek text are Apocalypse is Jesus Christu. Now, when you hear the word apocalypse, what do you think or feel? Most people in our day would say, oh no, something awful is about to happen. And this is how the media uses the word. Massive storms, war scenes, violent riots are spoken of as apocalyptic, even warning us that, quote, the following scenes may be disturbing to some viewers, close quote. Such scenes are disturbing, they are horrific, they're tragic, they're cataclysmic, even catastrophic, but not apocalyptic. When people of the first century heard this word, they responded, oh, great, something meaningful is about to happen. Bring it on. Bring it on? <laughs> Why? Because the word apocalypse means revealing what is ordinarily hidden. Revealing what is always there, but ordinarily hidden, hidden and opening it up to us. Opening, that's the operative word. As an opening of a door, as in lifting the cover off of a box, as is pulling back of a curtain. To reveal what was there behind the door, but ordinarily hidden. To reveal what is there in the box, but ordinarily hidden. To reveal what is there behind the curtain, but ordinarily hidden. Apocalyptic, more dynamically, means breaking through from hiddenness so that what was always there might now become visible. Now, we experience this a lot where we live. After days of gray clouds, the sun shines, and the mountains, which have been there all those days, break through in all their majesty. So the title of the last book of the Bible is The Apocalypse of Jesus Christ. The Apocalypse of Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ. The pulling back of the curtain of Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ. The breaking through from hiddenness of Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ. The book is all about a person, so bring it on. Now, apocalyptic literature is fundamentally pastoral. It's, it's, not, 
it's, it's, it's not airy-fairy. <laughs> it's fundamentally pastoral, and it has two pastoral purposes. The first is to set the present moment in light of the unseen realities of the future. Set the present moment in light of the unseen realities of the future. For if we can see the future, if only if for a moment, it changes how we see the present. The future, Jesus is coming. And he's bringing with him a new heaven and a new earth. He's bringing with him the city of God. And if we can see that city for only an instant, it changes the way we see our cities. The second pastoral purpose is more important. To set the present moment in light of the unseen realities of the present. To set the present moment in light of the unseen realities of the present. You see, the fundamental conviction of apocalyptic literature is things are not as they seem. Or more accurately, things are not only as they seem. There's more to reality, more to the present moment that we can know, that we can hear or know or see with our unaided senses. And apocalyptic opens up that more. And that is what the last book of the Bible is doing for us. Setting the present moment in all of its uncertainty and upheaval in light of the unseen realities of the future. But more importantly, setting the present moment in all of its uncertainty and upheaval in light of the unseen realities of the present. And it turns out that the greatest unseen reality of the present moment is a person. The greatest unseen reality of the present is Jesus of Nazareth, crucified, risen, ascended to the throne, and coming again. And the Apostle John would ask us, do you believe this? And he would say to us, unless you believe this, you will not understand the present moment correctly. Now, all of this means that if we read the last book of the Bible as John intended it to be read, we end up at the feet of Jesus. If we end up preoccupied with anyone or anything else, we've not read the book the way it's supposed to be read. If we end up preoccupied with the mark of the beast or who's the Antichrist or the battle of Armageddon or the millennium, we will have missed the message of the book. The title is not the revelation of the war of the worlds. <laughs> the title is not the revelation of a divine countdown clock. The title is the revelation of Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ. The title is the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ. Are you with me? I could use amen right now. So principle one, keep the title before us. Principle two, keep the nature of John's, keep before us the nature of John's experience on Patmos. John says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That is where we want to be on the Lord's day. In the Spirit, worshiping Jesus and his Father through the Spirit. And he says, while he was worshiping, Revelation 1.10, I heard behind me a voice, like a trumpet. Note the preposition, behind. I heard behind me. That is, he does not hear a voice in his head. He hears an objective voice behind me. That is, outside his head. And then he says, Revelation 1.12, I turn to see the voice. Turn to see the voice? Like, how does one see a voice? I know there's a program with that title, but how does one see a voice? Note the verb turned. He turned his body around to see this voice that is speaking behind him. John hears and something, he sees something outside himself. He is not having some kind of inner mystical experience. Let me say that again. John is not having some kind of inner mystical experience. He hears a voice outside of his head and mind, someone else's voice, not his own. And he turns his body around to see this voice, to see something outside himself. And I saw, he said, and goes on for 22 chapters to tell us what he saw. Revelation 1, 2, John bore witness to all that he saw. Now, what did he see? What was the nature of that experience on the Lord's day? I thought about this a lot since I wrote that book, on Discipleship on the Edge, and here's the best I can come up with. I think John 
sees and witnesses and experiences a live drama. I think that Jesus, with the help of his angel, 1-1, puts on a live drama in front of John with multiple acts and multiple scenes within the multiple acts. Somehow, Jesus plays out in the airspace in front of John this play. Not just in his imagination. It's external. It's out in front of him. Jesus puts on a play with sets and props and actors and costumes and lightning and sound effects. Now, how Jesus did it, we're not told. But that Jesus could do it, I have no doubt. After all, where did we, in our time, get the ability to put on such plays, to put on 3D films? Is it not from the creator and recreator of all things? Is not Jesus the first and best creative of all time, outdoing all of our technology? What John is told to then do is tell us all that he saw. What a challenge that was. Oh, my. To, which explains why he uses this word like so much in the rest of the book. It was like. He was like. They were like. It sounded like. And to tell us what it is like, John employs the imagery and language of the Roman and Persian political and religious worlds, which their, his first readers would have been familiar with. But most, to tell us what it is like, John appeals to the imagery and symbolism of the Old Testament. He actually quotes the Old Testament 150 times with 250 allusions, which says to me that we will more accurately understand the last book of the Bible when we read the rest of the Bible. Now, here's the important thing to know about this live drama. In the letter... John is not interpreting what he saw. He's reporting what he saw. He's describing the imagery and the symbols which Jesus has chosen to use. New Testament scholar Bruce Metzger once said, the descriptions are descriptions of the symbols, not description of the reality conveyed by the symbols. And so, Revelation chapter 4, Jesus presents himself as a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. Is that how Jesus actually looks right now, behind the curtain? If he pulled back the curtain now, is that what he would look like? I hope not. Seven is this number of completeness. Horns are a symbol of strength. Eyes are a symbol of wisdom. Jesus with seven horns and seven eyes is a way of speaking of the crucified lamb as immensely strong and immensely wise. Another example, Revelation chapter 9 locusts like horses. Some suggest that what John really saw were helicopters. But since there were no helicopters in his day, all he can think of was locusts like horses. No, Jesus did not put helicopters before John on Patmos. He put locusts like horses because locusts like horses from the Old Testament is the symbol of judgment. Another example from chapter 12. John sees an eagle with two wings coming to rescue the offspring of the woman who has given birth to the child who will rule the world. Some suggest that what John really saw was a United States Air Force jet coming to get redeemed Israel to bring them into the desert. Not. He saw an eagle with two wings carrying women and children. This is the picture of how God rescued his people from Egypt. Exodus 19.4, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So John is describing the symbols Jesus uses. He's not necessarily interpreting them directly. Now, in this drama, scenes change a lot, sometimes very quickly. And the characters change costumes a lot, <laughs> especially Jesus. As we read in chapter 1, he presents himself as a man, the glorious son of man, wearing a long robe, the robe of a priest, face shining like the sun, holding seven stars in his hands and a sword coming out of his mouth. In another scene, though, 
He presents himself as the lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. In another scene, he presents himself as a shepherd who is guiding the martyrs to the springs of water. And then interestingly, in the closing scene of the whole drama, he presents himself as a lamp. The lamb is the lamp of the glory of God in the city of God. Now, how John kept up with all of that, I do not know. How he remembered to, to, to write it all down, I do not know. But in his letter, he just keeps telling us what he saw. I saw, and I saw, and then I saw. All of it, something outside his heart and mind. Something Jesus is presenting to him. Oh, to see what John saw. So principle one, keep before us the title of the book. Principle two, keep before us the nature of John's experience. Principle three, keep before us the larger structure of the book, the larger structure of the drama as conveyed in the book. The basic structure is very simple. There's a prologue, verses 1, 1 to 8, and then there's this vision, 1, 9 to 22, 9, and then there's an epilogue, 22, 10 to 21. Now, here's the really cool thing. The vision between the prologue and the epilogue is built around the verb open. Doesn't, that makes sense, does it not, given the meaning of apocalypse? Open. John sees a number of things opening up to him. He uses this verb open four times. Four times he speaks of something opening up to him. For one, I looked, and behold, a door open in heaven. 11.19 and the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened. 15.5, and I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. And then 19.11, and I saw heaven opened. It reminds me of that line in Chronicles of Narnia, farther up and further in. All of it, by the way, fulfilling the promise Jesus made to his first disciples when he first met them. You will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So there are four uses of the verb open. 4, 1, 11, 19, 15, 5, and 19, 11. Now, these four open make for five sections of the vision. One before the first open, two after the first open, three after the second open, four after the third open, and then five after the fourth open. So the structure of the vision is Act 1, 1, 9 to 322, Act 2, 4, 1 to 11, 18, Act 3, 19, 11, 19 to 15, 4, Act 4, 15, 5 to 19, 10, and Act 5, 19, 11 to 22, 9. Now, you may not remember, but at the beginning, I quoted from New Testament scholar Richard Balcom and his assessment of the last book of the Bible. He said, it's a work of immense learning, remarkable creative imagination, not by John, but by Jesus, radical political critique, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar, profound theology, and astonishingly meticulous literary artistry. The whole book, astonishingly meticulous literary artistry. Let me show you what I mean by that. And I'll try to make this as clear as possible. This, this principle probably should have been a Saturday seminar. Okay, John conveys these five acts of the drama in a beautiful parallelism. It's a form that's used throughout the Bible. Many books of the Bible are put together this way. Parallelism. There's simple parallelism like A, B, C, D, E. Read Psalm 19 later in the day and you'll see how that works. But there's often then what's called the inverted parallelism. You have A, slip over, B, slip further, C, then go the other way, D, and then E. A and E belong together. B and D belong together, leading to C, that is the main point. Now, biblical scholars call this parallelism a chiasm. It's after the Greek word ki, written as an X, but the scholars use only one, one side of that X. They use a V, only turning it on its side. The best way to think of it is think of Canada geese in formation. Okay? Now, John has conveyed what he saw in this chiastic form. 
Jesus develops this drama in a chiastic form. You've got act one, then down and to the right, act two, down and to the right, act three, down and to the left, act four, and down and to the left, act five. Which means then that acts one and five are complementary, acts two and four are complementary, and act three is the middle. It's the main point of the whole book. Let me show you further how this works. Act one and five. Act one, Jesus, the glorified son of man, is in the middle of the seven churches. He calls them to overcome, and then he makes promises to the overcomers. Act five, Jesus is on a horse. He's the king of kings. He now fulfills the promises to those who overcome. So act one and five have overcome and overcome. Act two and four. Four, Jesus the lamb, seven seals, seven trumpets. Act four, complimentary, act two has Jesus the lamb, seven seals, seven trumpets. Act four, Jesus the coming one, Jesus the prophet and judge, the seven bulls. So in two and four, you have the seven, seven, seven. And then act three in the middle. Jesus the child born to be king the definition of overcoming, they overcame by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and by not loving their lives unto death, and they have the dragon and the two beasts. By the way, right there in the middle, 11, I mean 12, 11, is the explanation of how to overcome. They overcame by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and not loving their lives unto death. They were willing to die to not compromise. Now, when you look at the structure more carefully then, you soon discover that this drama these acts do not unfold chronologically. Yes, they go in an order, Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, Act, act, act 4, but the acts themselves do not uh, unfold the drama chronologically. The revelation of Jesus Christ, after all, is not a newspaper story. The content does not move in a straight line from beginning to end. Paul Spilsbury, who's the academic dean at Regent College, in his book, The Throne, the Lamb, and the Dragon, writes this. The book does not unfold in a straightforward, sequential way. Many times the actions of the visions take us back over territory we've already covered, introducing new information, changed perspective, and surprising twists of plot. So for instance, you have the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bulls. Those are three different ways of looking at the same thing, coming at the same thing from three different angles. And this is why Michael Wilcock of England cautions us. The question to ask while reading the book is not what happens next, but what does John see next? You don't ask what happens next. You ask what John sees next. Why? For the simple reason that what John sees next may not happen next. What John sees next may have happened a long time ago. And the best example of that is the very middle of the book, Act 3, Revelation 12, 1 to 2. And a great lion appeared, <laughs> a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations. Now, who is this woman? She's Israel of old. How do we know this? The phrase is, clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, 12 stars on the crown, is the exact same language that Joseph uses in the Old Testament, in Genesis 33, 9, to describe his mother and father and brothers, to describe Israel. She's with child. She's now going to fulfill the primary role of Israel in the world, namely to give birth to the child of Isaiah 9, whose name is Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. Over time, throughout the Bible, Israel becomes represented in smaller and smaller units until she's finally represented in the Virgin Mary. And John sees the woman, Israel, now Mary, about to give birth. 
to a male, says John, who will rule the world. Who's this child? Jesus. And then who's the dragon? John learns he's the devil, standing before the woman, waiting for her to give birth so that he can destroy the child. The dragon hates Messiah and everything Messiah does and, re and recreates. He wants to destroy him. Okay, now when did the action represented in this part of the drama take place? Right, at the first Christmas. Matthew tells us that Jesus is only born when the arch enemy of God working through Herod the Great seeks to kill Jesus. The scene in Revelation 12 happens long before John even becomes a disciple of Jesus. The text of Revelation 12 is a great Christmas Eve text. So, as we read through the vision given to John, as we work through these five acts in the live drama, we do not ask what happens next. We ask what John sees next, because what he sees next is not necessarily what happens next. So principle one, keep the title before us. Principle two, keep before us the nature of John's experience on Patmos. Principle three, keep before us, if we can, the larger structure of the book. And now principle four, easier to grasp, keep before us the commands of the book. There are two great commands. These are the major pastoral concerns of the book. Two great commands. The most frequent command is behold or look. Make sure when you're reading through the last book of the Bible that you have a version that keeps the behold. It's not just a nice literary touch. It is a command. It's the imperative form of the verb to see. And it's spoken at least 19 times throughout the book. And it always points to a surprise. It always points to something no one had anticipated. It always points to something no one could have deduced on their own. Revelation 1.17. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Did you see that this morning when you looked out your window? No. That's because you needed an apocalypse. Behold, look, he's coming. Revelation 1.18, behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death. Did you see that this morning when you turned on the news? No, you didn't see the keys in the news. That's because you need an apocalypse. Behold, I'm in your midst, in the midst of all that is going on in your world. I'm alive, and I hold the keys of death. So the first major exhortation is, behold, look. The second major command is, do not be afraid. Revelation 1.17, he laid his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. It's spoken again and again and again through the book because Jesus knows how afraid we are. Do not be afraid. And we ask, well, how do we move beyond fear? And he says, by beholding. We obey the second command by obeying the first command. We overcome fear by looking. We look away from that which is causing us fear and look at him who is with us and for us in the fear. John, I think, is telling us that we get so afraid and so afraid in our time because we are not looking where Jesus tells us to look. Look at me. Look, I'm the living one. Look, I'm knocking at the door. Look, I have the keys. So principle one, keep the title before us. Principle two, keep the nature of John's experience before us. Principle three, keep the larger structure before us. Principle four, keep the commands of the book before us. And principle five, keep before us the enveloping affirmations of the book. The book is enveloped or bracketed, if you will, by the prologue and by the epilogue. You have the prologue, act one, act two, act three, act four, act five, and epilogue. Now, in both the prologue and epilogue, um, the, John makes four great affirmations. Same affirmation in the prologue and the epilogue, and these are the affirmations being worked out in the rest of the book. The four are coming, near, must, I am. Coming. 1 7, behold, I'm coming. Behold, he, behold, he is coming. 22 7, behold, I'm coming quickly. 22.12, behold, I'm coming quickly. 22.20, yes, I'm coming quickly. Note present tense. Not I will come, although that is true. But I am coming. It's one of the mysteries of the present moment. 
He's coming. He's always coming, coming, coming. Near, 1-1, one, one. for the time is near. 22-10, for the time is near. But of course, for he who is coming is near. He's very near. When Jesus ascended to the throne, he did not go to a very far place. He just went behind the curtain. And he's very near. He can break through any time he wants to. And because he is near, the kingdom is near. It's what Jesus announced in his first little sermon, Mark 1.15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. The final coming of the kingdom of God is very near because the king himself is very near. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Must. 1.1. One, one. The things which must shortly take place. 22.6, the things which must shortly take place. What's he referring to? John is referring to the things that happen whenever the kingdom of God invades the world. He's referring to the things that happen when the kingdom of King Jesus comes up against all that is not in sync with his kingdom. John is saying, do not be afraid of turmoil and upheaval. It's the natural thing that happens when the kingdoms of this world resist the inbreaking of King Jesus. And then the great enveloping affirmation, I am. 1.8, God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. 1.17, Jesus says, I am the first and the last. 21.6, God says, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And then in 22.12, the most precious verse of the whole thing, whole book, Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. Oh, my goodness. All three of those lines are now on the lips of Jesus. Huge theological declaration. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. I am the first and the last. I'm the first and last letter of any alphabet. I'm the beginning and the end. The word beginning in Greek is the word arche. It can refer to number one in the sequence, but it primarily refers to the source of the sequence, to the archetype. The word end in Greek is telos. And telos refers to the inherent destiny of the sequence, to that which the sequence is pointing. Do you hear what Jesus is affirming in the beginning and end of the book? I am the arche and tell us of everything. Which means Jesus Christ is inescapable. No one can escape him. Which is why John says at the beginning, every, I will see him in one way or another. Jesus Christ is the archetype of creation and he's the inherent destiny of all of creation. Jesus Christ is the archetype of the human race. He's the inherent destiny of the human race. Jesus Christ is the archetype of your life and my life. He's the inherent destiny of your life and my life. He's the archetype of our children and grandchildren's life. He's the inherent destiny of our grandchildren's life. Someone has said this great I am affirmation relieves us of the awful burden of having the final responsibility. It relieves us of the final responsibility for the world. It relieves us for the final responsibility for our lives. It relieves us from the final responsibility for our children and grandchildren. The final responsibility lies with him who is the arcade and tell us of all. So keep before us. Keep before us the enveloping affirmation of the whole book and we'll keep our balance. I'm going to conclude with a story told about a sculptor who carved a statue of the Lord Jesus. People came from long distances to see it, to see Jesus in all of his strength and tenderness. And they would walk around the statue trying to grasp its splendor, looking at it from this angle and that angle. But the meaning of the statue kept eluding them until they consulted the sculptor who would invariably say, there is only one angle from which you can truly see Jesus in this statue. You must kneel. That is the posture from which to read the last book of the Bible. You must kneel. For that is the posture we find ourselves in when we finish reading the book. To him 
be all the glory and dominion forever and evermore. Amen.
thank you, Jesus, that you are the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, who was and is and is to come. Who was and is and is to come. All glory to our King. All worship to our King. All praise to our King. You are worthy in your holy name. What an incredible message that we just heard from Pastor Dale Johnson. And I hope it did the same for you as it did for me, just stirring this excitement for the book of Revelation and everything that we're gonna unpack here. And as Daryl said, this says we behold Jesus. It's like when we see him, it changes everything. And so hopefully as we go into this week, it changes everything about how we live in our day-to-day, -day, Monday to Friday. And if you are by one of our locations, make sure you check out online. We'd love for you to join us at one of our sites. You can find all our locations locations just by clicking on the link below. We hope to see you and hope you have a great week.